will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions. And you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all of your answers in the listening question booklet. At the end of the real test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to Section 1 of your booklet. Section 1. You are going to hear a conversation between an agent and Scott. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. Howdy, what can I do for you? I'm here to ship some things back to China. OK, we can do that. Shipping things back, eh? Have you lived there before? Yeah, I lived there for three years and came back two years ago. Now I'm going back to start my own business. Really? Did you ship things with us last time? No, I used a Chinese shipping agency. Well, I'll just let you know that rates have changed recently. So I don't know if they'll be comparable to what you pay before. It doesn't matter to me. My company's paying for it. Aha. Uh -huh. Then it's nothing off your skin, right? OK. I'll need your name and where you need to go to pick up the items to be shipped. My name is Scott Linder. L-I-N-D-E-R. And I live in upstate New York, Saratoga Springs. Oh, sure. I know that place. I go to the races there. Great town. What's the zip there again? Double seven o four two five. And the street address is 412 West Lake Road. 770425 West Lake. Got it. And how big of a container are you going to be looking for? Well, I didn't have a container last time, and I don't think I'll need one this time. I think that I'll have about six cubic meters. We can get a subsection of a container then. How big is that? It's two meters wide and three meters long. Two meters high, right? Yes, sir. Now look at questions 6 to 10. As the talk continues, answer questions 6 to 10. And for customs, I need to know what sort of items will you be shipping? Mostly furniture. But we'll also have quite a few boxes of books too. Any clothing? Nope but we'll have some bicycles and wood that we use for a loft bed. Be careful with those bicycles. I hear bicycle theft is a big problem in China. Not if you know how to secure your bikes and where to store them. Well, good luck. How valuable do you want me to list the entire shipment as being? Let's say about three and a half thousand dollars. Great. Now you'll also have to go over to the customs department to check with them about shipping the wood over to China. I know there are concerns about termites, bugs, etc. No problem. It's the same wood I brought over from China last time. Then you should be OK. It's just a formality. And last of all, where would you like the shipment to be delivered? Well, I will live in Beijing, but let's ship it to Tianjin. My company will pick it up there. That's all right then. Have a nice trip. Thanks for your help. This is the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You will hear an admissions officer from a UK university talking to a group of postgraduate students in a university abroad about applying for a place at his university. 
First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. As I said earlier, there is, I think, at Rexford an excellent combination of physical and geographical advantages. As well as having a rural setting and still being close to central London, something that will certainly be of interest to you is that Rexford is just 35 minutes from London Airport. At Rexford, we have a strong research capability. We came seventh out of 101 universities in last year's research assessment, carried out by a government body, and did particularly well in your particular subjects, engineering and science. Actually, we got a top research grade of five for engineering, geography and computer sciences. One further point and I know from talking to you individually that a number of you may be looking for some experience in industry after the course, is that all our science and engineering research departments have unusually close relationships with industry in the area. Anyway, that's enough sales talk from me. I'll just take a sip of this coffee that's just arrived, thank you, and then I'll say something about what actually happens when you apply. Right. Now, if you do decide to make an application, what you do is send it directly to me in my department. I will then immediately send confirmation and the application process begins. And I'd like to say at this point that you shouldn't worry if this process doesn't work all that quickly. I mean, occasionally there are postal problems, but most often the hold-up is caused by references. The people you give as referees, shall we say, take their time to reply. Anyway, it's absolutely normal for this process to take three to four months. What I do in this period is keep in touch with you and reassure you that things are moving along. One of the ways we've devised to help you decide about applying, as well as later when you've been accepted, hopefully, is to put you in contact with, if possible, a student from your own country who is at present studying with us. What you can do is phone them up, we will of course liaise between you, and discuss your concerns with them. That way you can get an objective opinion of what you can expect if you come to live and study at Rexford. Not only the academic atmosphere, but important details like what the leisure facilities are like and whether the English weather and food are really as awful as everybody says. No. <laughs> if you decide you can face it, the contact can also help you just before you leave with tips on what to pack and that sort of thing. At the moment, I think we've got two second-year students and one postgraduate from this country. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now, to move on to the other concerns you expressed earlier. At a UK university, as I'm sure you know, you will be in an environment where independent learning is the norm, which takes most students a while to adjust to, and at a time when you will be separated from your normal surroundings, and in most cases, your family. This can be a difficult time. But remember that something like 25% of our student body are international students like yourselves, and that there are several organisations in the university and city whose main purpose is to offer help and ensure that your time with us is enjoyable and useful. One or two of you touched on the subject of accommodation earlier, so I'll just add a few points. 
It is the university's policy to give priority in the allocation of residence places to three categories, and those are visiting students, exchange students, and new postgraduate students. However, demand exceeds supply, so there is still a need to put your name down early for campus accommodation, particularly if your family is accompanying you. This means that the earlier you decide whether you want to study with us, and so get the procedure moving, the better it will be for everybody. Um, yes.、Uh, what if you would prefer to live outside the university? If you're planning to live off campus, you've got to sort things out even earlier. As with everything in short supply, the good accommodation gets snapped up months before the beginning of term. In other words, if you're starting in October, you need to be thinking about it in June or at the very latest July. So you do need to think very carefully about what you need, how much you can afford to pay well in advance. What you can't do is leave it until a few days before the start of term. The agencies in town are pretty good. It's just a matter of contacting them in good time. Of course, we have a full-time accommodation officer available to help all students. She'll get in touch with you when you're accepted. She's got plenty of contacts in the town and will deal with the agencies on your behalf. One or two of you asked me earlier about your level of spoken English. Obviously, most of you have already achieved a lot. I wish I could speak your language half as well. Having said that, though, I'm afraid the lecturers will make little or no allowance for the presence of non-native speakers in the audience. So, anything you can do to improve your spoken English, even beyond the pretty high levels most of you have already reached, will help make your stay with us that bit more fun for you. Some extra practice before you arrive is worth more than, for example, private lessons afterwards when you won't really have time. Oh, and one last thing before I invite further questions: it's very important that you. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now to turn to section three. Section three. You will hear three students, Ben, Jane, and Tom, having a discussion about their architecture and design studies course. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Now listen to the first part of the conversation, and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. So, Tom, did you manage to get all your reading done? Yes, Ben, I did. What about you, Jane? Me too. Though it took much longer than I thought it would. Yeah, some of those dissertations are really long, aren't they?、Mm. Mm. I'm not looking forward to having to write mine. Well, that's not till next year. So, shall we compare thoughts about our reading?、Hmm. Let's start with twentieth-century architecture. I thought it was pretty impressive. There was quite a bit of detail. Yeah, all very relevant. I enjoyed the pictures, the diagrams, and photos. Hmm, they were quite strange. Not what you'd expect to find in a dissertation,、mm. but very helpful. Whereas sometimes I couldn't really follow the arguments. Yes, a bit of a mixed bag, really. While modern construction was very serious and thorough, wasn't it? Indeed, actually, it was rather dense. I didn't find it particularly easy to read either. The index was excellent, though, so I used that to guide me around. I still think it was a bit high level. 
I certainly wouldn't have wanted to try and cope with it in the first year. No, that's not who it's aimed at, of course.、Mm. What about steel, glass, and concrete? Not the world's most interesting title, of course. <laughs> Again, the index was helpful, though I think we could have done with more photos. There weren't really enough to support what he was saying in places. Yeah, but what he was saying was easy to follow, wasn't it? He takes you through step by step. It was hard to believe it had been translated. Seemed very natural.、Mm. Actually, it was better written than the next one, the space we make. But we're supposed to be thinking about architectural ideas, not being literary critics. <laughs> I like that one. Really, I just didn't think it covered the whole situation.、Mm. It didn't put the question of housing into the context of the time. You mean how in the fifties economic austerity limited the finances available, while a growing population needed housing quickly? Exactly. Again, I think you're asking too much of these dissertations.、Mm, perhaps you're right. Well, I did like change and tradition. Anyway, very focused. Yes, although I did think it was oddly arranged in some ways. When you went to the index to track something down, you couldn't necessarily find what you wanted. I know what you mean, but I have to say, I'd be very proud if I'd written any of these. True. <laughs> And you will next year. Now you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen to the rest of the conversation, and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. Never mind next year. It's this year that's the problem. I'm never going to get this assignment done. Yes, you are. Come on, let's make a plan for you.、Oh, please, I'm just not sure where to go from here. I could look at city plans, study the layout of housing developments. I think you need a closer focus. The approach to small houses won't necessarily tell you what you want to know. You'd be better to concentrate on large private houses. Study the drawings of those. Okay, though I don't know how much useful detail I'll be able to get from the kinds of plans that are easily available from that period.、Mm, it's true; they can be limited.、Mm. But what you could do as a next stage is go onto the web. There's loads of useful stuff there. More detailed plans, you mean? Well, I was thinking more of illustrations, that kind of thing. Do a search for window designs. I'm sure you'll find some good ones. I agree, and not just online. See what you do find there, and then for your next step, check both campus libraries. I think you'll be able to get hold of books which will give you further information, and you need to know more about typical furniture of the time. This is all very helpful. Thanks, guys. I'm beginning to think I should be able to get something done for Dr. Forbes after all. At least I can see I'll be in a position to tell him the section headings. Well, a bit more than that would be better. Put your outline plan together and give him that to look at. Hmm. Yes. But I'll still need to keep reading, won't I? Yeah. <laughs> Once Doctor Forbes has okayed what you've done at that point, you could then go and see Doctor Gray. He's very approachable, and I'm sure he'd be happy to provide you with further references. And then you could take it from there. That'd be really useful. Well. Thanks again. Let me get you both another coffee. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. You will hear part of a lecture about balloons and airships. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty.
Now listen to the lecture and answer questions 31 to 40. Now, balloons and airships are worth consideration because while on the one hand they represent humans' first successes at air flight, after centuries of less than successful theory and experimentation, they also, on the other hand, continue to be used today. We may have appeared to have moved on to jet planes and space rockets, but you can still see these more primitive flyers in the skies. OK, um, gas balloons first. France saw the first balloon flight in 1783, and this began a process of development. By 1862, in the Civil War in the United States, we find Thaddeus Lowe replacing spies with balloons to go behind enemy lines. The success of this led to the continued use of balloons in peacetime, and they were employed in the creation of maps. And such applications continue to this day, with balloons assisting in increasing our knowledge and understanding of the world we live in. Unmanned balloons are still widely used to collect data to inform scientific research of various kinds. You'd be surprised at how much they contribute. All sorts of instruments can be mounted in a balloon, and ongoing investigations into climate benefit from the information that can be gathered from a flight. Well, that's gas balloons. Now, the increase in the popularity of ballooning as a sport or leisure activity has been mainly due to the development of the modern hot air balloon being cheaper and safer than the gas balloon. Heating air, rather than using potentially explosive gas, is what makes these rise, although the process doesn't generate as much lift as with gas balloons. But this is a small price to pay for its other benefits, and this type of balloon is no doubt here to stay. Airships are also fairly old in their origins. The idea for a balloon that could be powered and steered was first published in France in 1784, although 1852 was the date of the first successful airship flight. The first airships, like the first aircraft, didn't provide any weather protection for their crew, so it must have been rather uncomfortable up there. But designs continued to develop in sophistication, it was realised that the ships would drift about if they weren't strengthened, and that to work effectively, they would have to have a framework. Once design started incorporating this, flights became longer and more reliable. Airships were deployed for various uses in the First World War, and once peace returned, designers began to turn their attention to ambitious plans for regular intercontinental flights. However, in the 1930s, this program more or less came to an end. For one thing, the speed and popularity of airliners meant that the airship appeared superseded. They just couldn't compete. And as if that weren't enough in itself, another factor in the decline of the airship was an alarming number of crashes. And this, of course, put people off. Nevertheless, several countries have continued to build smaller airships for various uses, such as naval observation or publicity purposes. In fact, their popularity seems set for a slight revival, and in the past few years there has been renewed attention paid to the possibility of using them to transport cargo. Who knows? Maybe the 21st century will be the age of the airship. Now, if you look at your handouts... You'll see that I've included some information. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.